We think that there's a supermassive black hole with a mass of millions or even billions of times the mass of our sun at the center of every galaxy in the universe. The issue is, we don't know of any processes in the universe that can let black holes grow to be so big. So we actually have no idea where these supermassive black holes come from. A supermassive black hole, or SMBH, is an especially large black hole. Any black hole with a mass of a million times the mass of our sun is usually considered to be supermassive. And it's very common to see SMBHs with masses in the range of billions to hundreds of billions times the mass of the sun. Remember that black holes are so dense that even though their masses are huge, their physical size might not be as large as you're thinking. For example, we know that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy with a mass of about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And this black hole is called Sagittarius A star. We know it definitely exists because we've watched stars at the center of the galaxy for a couple of decades, and they're definitely orbiting something. The speeds that the stars are moving at tell us how massive that something must be. And to fit 4 million solar masses in the region of space without destroying all the stars, it can only be a black hole. However, although this mass sounds absurdly large, the radius of this black hole is only about 12 million kilometers, which is actually only about 17 times larger than the radius of our sun. Considering the mass is 4 million times larger, this increase seems fairly small to me. The best direct evidence we have for supermassive black holes is actually this photo of the shadow of a black hole at the center of a galaxy called M87. It was taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, which is actually a whole bunch of telescopes on Earth combining to give one image. And while the black hole in the image is about 6.5 billion solar masses, it's only a little bit larger than our entire solar system, which I still find pretty crazy. So while the existence of supermassive black holes is certain, coming up with an explanation for how these outrageously large black holes formed has proved much harder. And it's still an open question in cosmology today. The very first stars in the universe had pretty large masses, and when they burnt out and went supernova, they could collapse to form black holes with masses of a few hundred solar masses. These can form by about 200 million years after the Big Bang, and since the universe is 13.7 billion years old now, you might think this is plenty of time to grow into an SMBH. However, even with 13.5 billion years of potential time to grow, by eating matter and merging with other black holes. We still don't think this is long enough and black holes simply can't grow fast enough to go from 200 solar masses all the way to millions of solar masses in that time. You see, there's actually a limit on how fast black holes can eat matter. It's called the Eddington limit. This comes from the fact that as matter, usually dust and gas, falls into a black hole, it tends to form an accretion disk around that black hole. This means that infalling matter tends to get accelerated and feel a lot of friction from the other matter in the accretion disk. And this friction heats up all the matter. We can see this in the glow of the accretion disks, the heat of which can actually cause them to shine brighter than entire galaxies. When this happens, we call them a quasar, which is a portmanteau of quasi-stellar, since they end up looking like massive stars on the sky. However, this actually limits the speed at which the black hole can eat the dust, because the heat produces radiation, which can carry the material surrounding the black hole away. This is called radiation pressure, and it can blow away the dust that the black hole is trying to eat, creating so-called outflows of dust and gas from the region around the black hole. It can still do this because the matter hasn't crossed the event horizon of the black hole yet. So while gravity is reasonably strong here, the dust isn't inside the black hole yet and it's still possible to escape the gravitational pull of the black hole. The faster the black hole tries to eat the matter, the more friction that matter feels and the hotter it gets and the more outward radiation pressure it produces. At some point, the Eddington limit, the accreting matter gets too hot and the outward radiation is too strong resulting in what is effectively a wind that can shut down accretion. Another issue is that we've seen supermassive black holes very far away in space, which means they formed a very long time ago, giving them even less time to have grown through accretion and mergers, and raising more questions for this formation method. This route of stellar collapse at the earliest possible times and then accreting matter to become a supermassive black hole doesn't seem to be feasible. So what are the alternatives? Well, nothing too certain yet we likely need some method of producing pretty big black holes early in the universe so that they can grow, in accordance with the Eddington limit, into supermassive black holes by the time that we can observe them. There are a few suggested formation mechanisms for this, such as the collapse of enormous quasi-stars in pre-galactic halos, or even the collapse of so-called dark stars made of dark matter. These dark stars might easily collapse into enormous black holes since dark matter doesn't feel the electromagnetic force, so there's probably 
very little pressure holding these dark stars up. While these might be pretty nice ideas, we have no evidence to support them yet, so I'm gonna file these away under very hypothetical for now. There is another alternative route to forming SMBHs, one that involves seeding them with so-called primordial black holes. These are black holes that form in the very early universe, not through stellar collapse because they form long before any stars can form. Rather, they form through the collapse of random overdensities in space that might come about as a result of the exponentially accelerating expansion of the universe called inflation that took place immediately after the Big Bang. I should admit that I do have a bit of a soft spot for primordial black holes because part of my PhD involves studying them and their formation certainly deserves its own video. So for now, just know that it might have been possible to form black holes from random fluctuations right after the Big Bang. This formation route has a couple of really nice advantages over forming SMBHs through the stellar collapse and growth method we just discussed. Firstly, primordial black holes can form at much larger masses than black holes forming from the death of stars. Stellar collapse black holes are always less massive than the star that produced them. And since stars are limited in how large they can get, this also limits the size of the black holes they can form. Primordial black holes don't have this limitation, and a primordial black hole forming one second after the Big Bang would have a mass of about 10,000 solar masses, and ones forming later would be even more massive. The second advantage that PBHs have over stellar black holes is that because they form so early in the universe's history, they have much longer to grow into supermassive sizes through accretion and mergers meaning that the Eddington limit is much less impactful on their status as potential seeds for SMBHs. As for which of these, if any, is the actual answer, I don't know, but hopefully we'll figure it out one day soon. Let me know what you think in the comments below and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. Until next time, stay safe team. I'll see you soon. Bye.